Chapter 7, Finders Cheaters. Jesse first thought that Dr. St. George didn't look like a dragon slayer. He looked like a movie star. Jesse and his parents had once been bumped up to first class on a plane flight. A famous movie actor had been sitting across the aisle from them. Jesse couldn't stop staring at him. In the movies, the star had looked tall and handsome. <coughs> up close, he was much shorter and his head looked huge. He was still handsome, but he was almost too handsome. The man fascinated Jesse in much the same way. His big, handsome puppet head was covered with long hair the color of tarnished gold. Behind the round lenses of wire-rimmed glasses, Dr. St. George's eyes were so dark and shiny, they looked varnished. My prize, Dr. St. George said in a voice that was deep and low and sweet to the ear. Jesse snuck, sneaked a look to, at Daisy, who was staring at the stranger with her jaw hanging open. I'm glad the kids could help, said Uncle Joe. What is this lizard anyway, Dr. St. George? The guys right here thought you might be a green basilic from Costa Rica. An amateur might come to that conclusion, Dr. St. George said, but she is a Mikus indectipus from the island of New Caledonia. She was found in the hold of a ship that put in from the South Seas. The captain brought her to me. He didn't realize that the discovery of the century. You see, there hasn't been a Mikus indectipus sighting since the year 1643. St. George spoke in a voice so mesmerizing. Jesse found himself almost believing what he said, even though he knew it was a lie. Gee, said Uncle Joe, did you hear that, guys? This little lizard could wind up being on the evening news. Dragon Piddle, Jesse managed to say, St. George brought his face close to Jesse's. Jesse recoiled. The man had shockingly bad breath. What did you say? St. George whispered. Jesse felt a bit faint. I said, Dra but he winced and broke off, feeling a searing pain in his left arm where Daisy had dug her nails into his flesh. He wants to learn to play the wagon fiddle she told St. George in a steady voice. It's his very favorite instrument, isn't it, Jesse? She gave Jesse a stern look, and he nodded obediently. Oh, yeah, the wagon fiddle, said Jesse. It's a real old instrument. Early settlers brought it here on covered wagons. Daisy nodded enthusiastically. Really, she said. Hmm, said Uncle Joe. That's a new one to me. Dr. St. George turned slowly back to Uncle Joe. I have some tests to do to prove my theory, but I'm never wrong. Wait a sec. What kind of test? Jesse blurted out. Far too complex for any child to grasp, said St. George, smiling at Jesse with perfect teeth. Jesse seized while Dr. St. George turned back to Uncle Joe and continued. Some idiot assistant in my lab left the cage wide open two days ago. I gave him such a dressing down. Imagine letting a prize like that escape. He opened a big black leather box by his feet and took out a cage with thick iron bars. It looked like the world's smallest jail cell. You're not going to put her in there, are you? Jesse asked in a quavering voice. How would you suggest I transport her other than a cage? St. George asked, looking down with his nose. Jesse glanced out the window. In front of the house was the big black million dollar car. Besides him, Daisy sniffled and blew her nose. St. George reached out to take Emmy. Like lightning, Emmy uncurled from her ball and hissed at him. Oh, Nellie! said Uncle Joe, taking one giant step back. St. George had leapt back, too. Without taking his eyes off Emmy, he pointed at Jesse and said, 
You boy, put her in the cage for me. She has grown violent in the last 48 hours. It must be the cage, Jesse said with a growl. But all the same, he put Emmy in the cage. It was the hardest thing he ever had to do. Emmy seemed to understand because she didn't lash out at him or spit. She only went limp and dull. Her eyes had even lost their glow. Goodbye, my sweet little Emmy, said Daisy with a feeble wave of her fingers. Tears rolled down her cheek, and her nose was running. Sorry, Emmy, Jesse told the little dragon. He did want to add, don't worry, we'll think of something. But at the moment, he had no idea what that could be. St. George was staring at both of them as if they had just burst into flame. What did you just call it? He whispered. What, what do you mean? Jesse asked. St. George's eyes pinned Jesse to the wall like a pair of darts. You heard me. What did you just call it? We call her Esmeralda, he said. For some odd reason, Jesse felt like it was important to keep Emmy's real name a secret from St. George. Daisy caught on immediately. Yeah, after Cinderella's ugly stepsister. You know, because she's not really beautiful, although to us she is. Daisy trailed off miserably. Jessie held her breath. Cinderella's stepsisters were Anastasia and Drizella, but maybe St. George wouldn't know that. St. George's eyes narrowed and he said, Hmm, well, I have to be going now. I have tests to do. Wait a minute, said Daisy. She pulled up the hem of her t-shirt and wiped away her tears. Then she took the purple knee sock out of her pocket. She needs this. St. George stared at the sock suspiciously. Why? It's far too complex for a mere grown-up to grasp, Jesse said through his teeth. She just needs it, St. George. That's Dr. St. George, he said. And where I come from, it's pronounced St. George. Does one, Jesse said dearly wishing he could go back to wherever he came from and leave them and their dragon. Daisy pushed the purple knee sock between the bars of the cage. The little dragon grasped it in her forepaws and buried her face in it. St. George fastened the latch. He lowered the cage into the box and snapped it shut. Good day to you all, he said, lifting the case. Then he walked out the door, coattails flapping behind him like a cape. Uncle Joe stared at him. Then he took off his rock star cap and tugged thoughtfully at his ponytail. Did you guys happen to notice that man ever never said thank you? The moment Jesse shut his bedroom door, Daisy exploded. You what? Being the target of Daisy's wrath was not comfortable. She sat down hard on Noah's bed and he sat on Aaron's. On the carpet between them, there were still bits of green and gold sparkling in a pile. Jesse repeated what he had said to her on the way up the stairs. I saw St. George's car parked outside our house the night before last, and yesterday on the way to town. You saw it again? Jesse nodded, bowing his head. Outside Miss Lodi's, and the day before, I saw him on High Peak. I guess you and Uncle Joe were too busy to notice him, but I did. I knew he was following us. Well, I did, and I didn't. I thought he might be, but I wasn't sure. But why didn't you say anything to me, she said. If I had known, we could have come up with a plan. Jesse knew Daisy was right. It all seemed very obvious to him now, but at the time... I, I guess I didn't want to worry if it was nothing, he said. And all this stuff was happening, the thunder egg, and Emmy hatching, and getting her fed, and Professor Anderson. Daisy interrupted him. We're supposed to tell each other everything. Isn't that what we pledged to do if we ever had a magical adventure? Keep the faith and tell each other everything? 
Jesse Tiger, I swear, you're worse than Edmund. Frowning, she folded her arms across her chest and looked away from him. Jesse shook his head sadly. In the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy's brother, Edmund, had been horrid, at least when he first entered Narnia. Jesse wondered if he was really that bad. Having a magical adventure was turning into much more serious business than he could have ever imagined it would be. Daisy pounded her fist on her knees. Oh, all right, I'm sorry I said you were worse than Edmund. That was mean, she sighed. You're not horrid, and it's stupid for us to fight. We need to help Emmy, not fight about her. Let's ask Professor Anderson what to do. Jesse bit his lip. He knew she was right. He went over to the desk, dropped down into the chair, switched on the computer, and waited stonily for it to boot up. As soon as the professor's stern and ancient face came on the screen, Jesse steeled himself, clicked the mouse, and began to tell him everything, starting with, there was this big black car. He spoke quickly, and he told the truth about how he ignored the car, and how he had put up signs, and they had played right into the hands of the dragon slayer and how they lost their baby dragon. The screen remained still and silent for such a long time that Jesse wondered if Professor Anderson had abandoned the site, leaving only his picture behind. The cousins watched nervously. Maybe you were speaking Slurvarian, said Daisy. Maybe he didn't understand you. Maybe he needs you to enunciate succulently. Jesse took a deep breath and began again. There was a big black, I heard you, Professor Anderson thundered at them. Jesse and Daisy shrank from the screen. We're really, 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 really sorry, said Jesse in a small voice. Professor Anderson scowled and said, don't waste your time with precious self-recrimination. What? Jesse whispered to Daisy. Do not feel too badly, the professor explained. No doubt you meant well. St. George is a formidable opponent, and now at least you know what you're up against. Jesse said, but he's a grown-up, and we're just kids. You are dragon keepers, Professor Anderson roared. Now stop sniveling and find a way to get her back. It is St. George's intention to slay your dragon and drink her blood. Daisy gasped. You have some time, the professor said. He will not take his thirst until he has attained a certain size. What size? Jesse asked. I dare say you have till the end of a fortnight, he said. A month, perhaps. It's difficult to make an accurate prediction. Each dragon grows at its own rate. And at this, the first dragon born in age environmental influences may have a bearing. Daisy nodded solemnly. Whatever that means, Jesse muttered. In the first four or five days of life, Professor Anderson went on, dragons double their size each day. At that rate, by the end of two weeks, sh she should be sufficiently sizable to... Okay, okay, we get it, Jesse said, finally feeling sick. The professor's face softened. He said gently, Your distress is not unwarranted. This could spell doom, not only for Emerald, but for the world. The world? Echoed Jesse in a hushed voice. He and Daisy exchanged looks. This was even more serious than they thought. Daisy placed his, her hand over Jesse's on the mouse and then clicked. She leaned in toward the screen and asked loudly, How can we get her back? Can you tell us, please? You are the dragon keepers. You must find the way, Professor Anderson replied. But know this, for as long as I can remember, St. George has always had only one true master, and that is greed. Then came the now familiar grinding sound of the blank screen. Jesse shook his fish. I wish we wouldn't keep doing that, he said. Daisy drummed her fingers on the back of the chair. Did you notice he called her Emerald? She thought 
said thoughtfully. He said this thing could spell doom for Emerald. I heard. That's her name, isn't it? Jesse said crossly, pounding the keys, trying in vain to get the sight back. It's the name you gave her. All right, but I don't think we ever told him that. In fact, I'm 100% sure we didn't. The next morning, they ate their bowls of cereal standing over the sink. Neither tasted its crunchy goodness, but both knew they would need energy for the plan they had to come up with from the night before. Uncle Joe was sitting at the table with a notebook and a pile of rocks. With a sharp pencil and tiny handwriting, he was writing a long column of numbers, letters, and symbols. The cousins rinsed out their bowls and put them in the dish drainer. Then Daisy went to stand behind her father's chair, and she wrapped her arms around his neck. Poppy, she said, we're gallivanting over to the college this morning. We want to see how Emmy's doing. Uncle Joel looked up and stared at them with, their, with narrow eyes. He shook his head and went back to his notebook. Don't be pests, he said. Don't worry, said Daisy. Dr. St. George won't even know we're there. When, we got to the when they got to the college gate, they stopped to ask where Dr. St. George's office was. The guard told them that St. George had a lab over in the basement of the zoo. The zoo was what people at the college called the zoology building, where scientists and students learned about animals. Jesse and Daisy rode their bikes over to the zoo and parked behind the building. Near the trash cans, they crawled into the bushes that grew in front of the basement windows. Daisy twitched her nose. You smell that? Jesse sniffed, then nodded. Chili peppers. They crawled past a set of windows, looking down. The green tables crammed with cages, teeming and wriggling white rats. The smell was growing stronger. They crept past a set of windows, looking down on a cage of monkeys. There were test tubes and beakers and chemicals and blackboards full of numbers and symbols. The smell grew stronger. Finally, they came to a set of windows that were completely covered with white sheets. Unlike the other windows, these were cranked wide open and any strong smell wafted out. Jesse lifted a corner of one sheet and looked into the room. If he angled his head just right, he could see Emmy in her iron jail. I see her, he whispered to Daisy. Daisy peered in. She got a lot bigger. Jesse nodded. Emmy was now the size of a large rabbit. The cage was too small for her, and the bars were pressing into her beautiful green scales. Emmy had her back to them, but she lifted her head at the sound of their voices. She was so cramped she couldn't even turn around to face them. Jesse, let me out, she cried. She had called out these exact words when she was inside the thunder egg. It tore Jesse's heart to hear them again. He clenched his teeth and said, That's it. We're going to get her now. Daisy grabbed his leg. Jesse, no. St. George could be back any minute. That's not a plan. Emmy called out, Jesse, Daisy, hide, Batman. Jesse let out a shaky breath and quickly lowered the sheet just enough to allow both the tiniest peek into the laboratory. They heard the tumbling of a lock and a key turn. Beside him, Daisy stiffened and sucked in her breath. That was a close one, Jesse whispered. St. George stepped into the lab. He was wearing a long white lab coat in place of his black one. He looked around the room with his wire rim reflecting glasses in the fluorescent light, giving him that super creepy no-eye look again. Over his nose and mouth, he was holding a white handkerchief. Daisy put her mouth up to see to Jesse's ear and whispered, He hates the smell. Jesse nodded and wondered whether being in captivity made Emmy give off an even stronger smell, or if she just smelled stronger because she was bigger. St. George leaned down and looked into Emmy's cage. He said something they couldn't hear. 
then took a pencil out of his coat pocket and poked it through the bars that touched Emmy's green horn. Emmy hissed. Then she opened her mouth and spat at him. St. George pulled back, dropped the pencil and handkerchief, and clutched his right hand. He staggered to the sink and ran water over his hand. The cousins, still as statues, held their breath. Standing at the sink, St. George couldn't have been more than two feet from them. If he had happened to look up at them right then, he would have seen them and the plan and as plain as the horn on Emmy's head. St. George turned off the water and walked away. Jesse and Daisy let out a, a breath. He bent over and took his first aid kit out of the cupboard. He wrapped gauze around his hand. Daisy once more put her mouth to Jesse's ear and whispered, Looks like she spat acid at him. Jesse nodded. They would have to ask Professor Anderson about that. St. George, handkerchief back over his nose and mouth, was now jotting down something on a clipboard. Jesse tugged on Daisy's arm, and together they pulled away from the window and crawled back out of the bushes. I have a plan. Jesse said to Daisy. And that's the end of chapter 7. Chapter 8 is called The Dragon Slayer's Den.